opportunity to speak about a myriad of different issues. Uh, I supported the governor then, and I support him now. And I'm uh, uh, very pleased to have him back in the state, Mrs. Romney. Governor, thank you very much. Uh, good luck, and welcome back to New Hampshire. Mrs. Romney? <laughs> It's great to uh, actually start this process again and to be in a place where um, we feel it is uh, an, an extraordinary uh, thing that happens in New Hampshire where people really do get to know the candidates on a personal level. So some familiar faces in the audience and uh, some faces we've seen before. Uh, you all know that announced yesterday. Um, Reason and an important reason why I encouraged him to run, and I am so supportive of him. You know, I love my children, they're great, but I gotta tell you, I love my grandkids even more. <laughs> it's so wonderful to have grandchildren, and my children are gonna be okay. This, uh, this economy is tough right now, but I'm not that worried about my, about my children. I am extremely worried about my grandchildren and their future and their ability to have jobs that will give them the kind of life that all of us enjoy right now. And that's why I pushed it into this and said I'm behind you because as I look at, at who could lead this country and give us back the jobs we need, um, I said, Man, you know what? Sorry, sweetie, it's up to you. So that's why um, I'm supportive of him uh, doing this again. It's a tough process. I've been through it before. And some of it's good and some of it's not so good. And you have to um, recognize that and know that it's worth the fight and worth, um, for me, my love of this country and my love of my grandchildren and hope for a better America with prosperous jobs for all. So, sweetie, it's up to you. generous to applaud even though we haven't said much yet and uh, I appreciate that uh, a number of you got up this morning to, to listen to Anna and me and we're here to hear from you as well as from us and so I'm going to say a few words and then turn to you and, and your offer of counsel advice or questions uh, is welcome uh, a little more about Ann don't know well, how well you know her uh, she and I met in high school actually she was 15 Went to a party I happened to go to at a friend's house. She came with someone else. I told the guy, I live closer to Ann than you do. Can I give a ride home for you? <laughs> and uh, uh, we've been going steady ever since. That was, uh, uh, let's see, we've been married 42 years. It was four years before we were married, so that's 46 years that she and I have been together. And, uh, it, it has been all good, uh, but there have been some times of, uh, of challenge and heartbreak. Uh, when she was diagnosed in 1998 with multiple sclerosis, that was a tough time. And uh, uh, she, uh, she was getting ready for, uh, for an elevator to go in the house to take, us, take her to the second floor because she really couldn't use her right leg very well. We thought that she'd be in a wheelchair at some point. We happened at this time to go out to Utah to help run the Olympic Winter Games. And uh, she was fortunate to get good treatment from good doctors and people who practiced Eastern medicine, Western medicine, prayer, horseback riding, all the things she did, she has been able to recover and to, uh, to hold back that disease. And, uh, and then a couple of years ago, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And uh, she went through the surgery and the radiation that's associated with that and battled back from that. She is the champion in our family. She's a fighter and, uh, and she's my inspiration. Thank you, sweetheart. Me too. Um, I spoke yesterday a bit about my dad, but I wanted to tell you more about it because uh, he's a lot of inspiration to me as well. I'm seeing someone there. You remember George Romney? Yeah. Remember that name? Yeah. yeah. He, uh, he was here running for president in 1968, and uh, uh, I hope I do better than he did because he got up <laughs> before the New Hampshire primary. But, uh, but dad, uh, dad actually was born in Mexico. His parents were American, but they were living in Mexico at the time. 
And uh, there was a revolution, I believe, at the time. Uh, well, he was about five years old, and so they moved back to the U.S. And his dad went broke more than once. Uh, they were in the construction business, and I guess construction. Well, I see some nodding heads. Yeah, construction sometimes has highs and lows, and they had a hard time. They lived in Los Angeles and, and then Idaho, and then finally Utah, and. Uh, they were able to make it go. My dad learned how to, to be a lath and plaster carpenter. They used to put, instead of drywall, now, okay, instead of drywalls, so it used to be lath and plaster, little strips of wood that you'd nail up uh, on, the, on the two by fours, and then you'd plaster over the strips of wood. And, and dad could take a handful of nails, put them in his mouth, and spin them out point forward, and then boom, <laughs> boom, boom, and put them on, and put up this lath. He was very good at it. Uh, and uh, he never had the time or the money to actually finish college. So he didn't graduate from college. But he believed in America. And he believed in the opportunity that America represents. And that the circumstance of your birth is not a barrier to what you can accomplish in this country. And so he, uh, he grew up and uh, was able ultimately to become head of a car company. Lived in Detroit is where I was born. And, uh, and, and led a company called American Motors. They made Ramblers. Remember those? A few of you remember those. Ramblers and Jeeps. Jeeps are still around. Ramblers aren't. Except in my garage, I have one, 1962. And then, uh, and then uh, when he and mom got married, uh, his financial resources weren't a lot better. Uh, he filled the back of the car with aluminum paint. And he sold aluminum paint along the way to pay for gas and hotel bills. And ultimately, he became governor of one of the states where he sold aluminum paint. This guy is a, a real American story. And, uh, and a lot of what I learned about America and the confidence I have in America came from my dad. And my conviction of the greatness of the American spirit comes from him and from my wife and from people I've met all over the country. I know it is, uh, um, in some circles, fashionable to be cynical about America. And to think that somehow the challenges, the challenges we face are so severe that the American people aren't up to it, up to overcoming them, up to solving them. And I've, I've had the chance now through my life in business, which was 25 years, and then at the Olympics, which was three years, and then, and then serving as governor, and then campaigning, I've had the chance to get to know the American people pretty well. And, and I've been inspired. I, uh, at, at the end of my, my service as governor of Massachusetts, towards the end, I got a call one day, uh, and uh, it came from the airport. They said that a U.S. air jet was flying in to Logan Airport in Boston. And the, on board was the, the body of a service man killed in Iraq, as I recall. And, uh, and the parents had been unable to be notified in time to get there to receive the body. And they had asked if I could go to the airport to receive the body. And of course I said yes. And uh, left my office immediately. And we drove out of the tarmac. There was a state trooper that took us out there. The U.S. Air Jet came in, the passengers disembarked, the luggage was taken off, and then down this, this ramp uh, came the casket of the serviceman. And the, uh, there were a number of state troopers that were there on the tarmac at the time, and they, they took out, uh, they, they saluted the, uh, the casket and the flags that came down. I put my hand over my heart, and I happened to look up into the terminal, because uh, we're right next to that U.S. Air Terminal with a big glass wall. And the people coming off the plane had seen all the police cars down there and wondered what was going on. So they were lined up against the window to see what was happening. And then people walking down the hall saw the people lined up at the window, so they backed in behind them. So there was a big crowd up there. And I looked up there, and every single person I saw had their hand on their heart. And I couldn't see the tears, but I could read the tears and sadness and respect and appreciation in their faces. We are a patriotic people, and we face extraordinary challenges right now. But we're going to overcome those challenges, in part because of the energy and passion and patriotism of the American people. Now, we come from different backgrounds. Some are going to school. I saw, where did that young guy go? He went to school, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. Some are going to school. Some here are retired. Some are veterans. Some are not. Moms, dads, single moms, single dads. Um, all different backgrounds. But we come together in New Hampshire to do something which you may take for granted, but it's really quite extraordinary. One of the great achievements in the history of the world. For all the wealth and power of the United States of America, the source of our greatness is not that wealth. 
the source of our greatness is our self-rule. The fact that we have a government that ultimately responds to a free people, an independent people. And so we, we come to you at the beginning of this process for you to have a choice to decide who's going to lead this country over the next four years. And I, I happen to believe that we took a kind of an American uh, idea and gave someone new a chance three years ago. We elected Barack Obama, a guy who we didn't know terribly well, who didn't have a very extensive record, no experience in the private sector, no, no experience in leadership, no experience really in, in uh, negotiations. And uh, we said, let's give this guy a chance because he was so well-spoken and promised a lot of things we liked. Now, three years later, into his fourth term, we don't have to just look at the promises, we can look at the record. And the truth is that Barack Obama has failed America. And, and I say that recognizing that he, he's tried. But I, I'm reminded of that old saying Ronald Reagan used to have. He said, it's not that liberals are ignorant, it's just that what they know is wrong. <laughs> and and what, what he did simply was wrong. On almost every dimension, what he did did not help the economy get out of the, the slide it was in. But instead, he extended the downturn and made it deeper. And, and so today, three years into his term, we have more news that unemployment has ticked up again. We have 16 million people out of work or have just stopped looking for work. Millions more are in jobs that are well beneath their capacity. We have home values continuing to, to decline three years later. Three years later, we have record number of foreclosures. Three years later, we have higher gasoline prices, higher food prices, people feeling more squeezed. The Obama prescription for the economy didn't ail what hurt us. Instead, it made things worse. And I believe it's time to have someone who's actually had a job do the job of getting jobs for the American people.
And with energy a, a problem, they had cap and trade to rise to raise energy prices. That's just what he did. With unemployment, unemployment high, they pushed more unions, just like he did with his uh, his card check and his stacking of the NLRB, National Labor Relations Board, in favor of organized labor bosses. He has been awfully European. You know what? European policies don't work there. They sure as heck aren't going to work here. I believe in America. Founders of this nation crafted what our nation would be. They considered not just our political rights and our political freedom as important as those things are, they also considered our economic freedom. They said we wouldn't be led by a king or a central government that told us what to do and how to do it and what to make and how to get paid for it. Instead, we can each choose our life's course, not just our elected representatives. We can choose our life's course. And by virtue of that decision, they made this the place on the planet that every entrepreneur, every pioneer, every freedom lover wanted to come here. It's made us who we are. It allowed our economy to outperform those of, of the European nations from which we sprung and some of the great Asian nations which, with larger population. We are a great and powerful nation in part because of the passion and dedication of those early pioneers, those founders of this great nation. I believe in America. I believe in free enterprise. I believe in capitalism. I believe, I believe in the Constitution. I believe in the Constitution. By the way, when the, when, when the founders said we're going we're gonna to have certain powers at the federal level, but we're going we're gonna to preserve at the state level all those powers not specifically given to the federal government, that Tenth Amendment, it, it's one that I don't think Barack Obama has read. I know he went to law school. Go read the Tenth Amendment again. Recognize the power. I believe in the greatness of America. I uh, I was really troubled as the president in his early days in his administration went around the world apologizing to the world, saying we dictated to other nations. No, Mr. President, we, we freed other nations from dictators. This is a... This is the greatest nation in the history of the earth for a lot of reasons. You know the big reason. The big reason is because this is a nation that was willing to lay down the lives of our sons and daughters to defend our own liberty and to share liberty with others. And of course, even something which seems more mundane to a lot of people, and that's our economic system, our free enterprise system. Even the Chinese today are copying the, the, uh, the principles that we developed to build our economy. And as they do so, tens of millions of people every year are coming out of poverty. And over there, poverty means making less than a dollar a day. This is what we've contributed to the world. There's no reason to apologize for America. We should be proud of America and hold to the Let me just say one more thing about my confidence in our future, and that is, uh, I mentioned the hands on the hearts of the people at the airport. Um, at the U.S. Air Terminal. I, uh, I noted during the Olympic Games that I had the chance to help organize that every time one of our athletes got a gold medal and they played the national anthem that, that our athletes put their, their hand in their heart. And I noticed that the other athletes around the world didn't do that. Ours is a apparently a unique tradition. And I wonder when that began. And I, I was told it, it began under FDR during the Second World War. He asked us to place our hands over our heart during the playing of the national anthem. This in recognition of the blood shed by heroes proved in liberating strife, who more than self their country loved, and mercy more than life. This is a great and patriotic nation. We face extraordinary challenges. We are going to overcome them. And we're going to overcome them with leadership that will tell us the truth, live by the Constitution, and get America on the right track again.
first of all, welcome to New Hampshire. Thank you. Welcome Good to be back. back. And uh, your statements about your grandchildren kind of redound to the kind of question I'd like to ask. Uh -huh. uh, questions about um, climate change. Um, how to deal with climate change is a policy issue. The science of climate change is not. My question is not about policy, that is, the mitigation of climate change. It is about the recognition of science. In 2010, the National Academy of Sciences issued a, a comprehensive report which was depressing about Congress. Their conclusion was there's a strong and credible body of scientific evidence that shows that climate change is occurring, is caused largely by human activities, and is a significant risk for a range of human activities. They further went on to say that some scientific conclusions or theories have been so thoroughly evaluated and supported by so many independent observations that these, the likelihood of these being found uh, wrong is vanishingly, and vanishingly small. This is the case for climate change. <laughs> My question to you, sir. Uh, nearly all the other candidates uh, suggest that there is no scientific consensus on climate change. Some insist that it's not even occurring. We cannot have a meaningful discussion about solutions until there's agreement about the problem. Will you, sir, state now that under a Romney administration, global warming will be accepted as a reality, and this reality will form the foundation for all climate and energy policy. Thank you. Thank you. Are you you work in the in the energy field, or are you, are you an academic, or what? You got interested in this area? Tell, tell us more about yourself. I'm just an informed citizen. Okay, great. Um, it's an important topic, and and I actually had the privilege of writing a book at the end of my last campaign. I uh, I found that uh, one of the challenges in a campaign is that most of the time you answer short questions with short answers. Uh, you're on debates and you get one or one and a half minutes and you don't get to lay out your views on a whole host of issues. And so I wrote a book called No Apology and in there I have a section on this very topic, on energy, on, on uh, global warming and so forth. And I indicated my view. I, I don't uh, speak for the scientific community, of course, uh, but I believe the world is getting warmer. I, 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 I can't prove that, uh, but I believe based on what I read that the world, the world is getting warmer. Uh, and, and number two, I believe that humans contribute to that. I don't know how much our contribution is to that because I know there's been there have been periods of, of greater uh, heat uh, and warmth in the past, but but I believe that we contribute to that, and so I think it's important for us to reduce our emissions of, of pollutants and greenhouse gases that may well be significant contributors to uh, to the climate change and the, and the global warming that you're seeing. Now, how do we go about doing that? One of the uh, opportunities I think is that the people who are really focused on climate change. And, and global warming have the same interests as the people who are really focused, as I am, on getting ourselves off of our dependence on foreign oil. I, I happen to think that buying every year a half a trillion dollars worth of oil outside the country really hurts our economy. And I also think it puts us in a position of, uh, of uh, jeopardy in some respects to the energy cartels that have the capacity to, to pull strings that would affect our, our national interests. And so I want to get us off of our dependence on foreign energy. And, and so there's some things we could do that basically accomplish both. One is to use more natural gas in the production of, of electricity, to use more natural gas in the, in the uh, propulsion of our vehicles. We have just found through something known as horizontal drilling. It sounds a little strange, but, but the scientists, we used to drill holes vertically into the earth. And now they found a way to drill vertically and then to go horizontally and to tap into all sorts of gas pockets. And we've developed about 100 years of additional nat natural gas for this country. I want to get that natural gas into usage in our truck fleets, on our interstate highways, in power generation. The natural gas is far less CO2 emitting, and it's also domestic. So it solves both the challenges that we talk about. Nuclear power doesn't generate uh, carbon dioxide. It's also domestic. And, and nuclear power is something I think we have to have. And so I, I look at our natural resources and our domestic resources and say, you know what, America can be energy independent, independent of our dependence on, on the cartels. We'll still, of course, trade in energy. We have Canadian energy and so forth we'll trade with. But I want to get ourselves off of our dependence on foreign energy and at the same time move towards sources that are far less CO2 emitting. I also want to see us, to be, see us become more energy efficient. I, I'm told that we use almost twice as much energy per person as does a European. And more like three times as much energy as does a Japanese citizen. We can do a lot better. I'd like to see us in our 
vehicles, in our homes, in our uh, systems of, uh, of uh, insulation and so forth become far more efficient. I think that's happening and believe that we have a role to try and encourage that to happen. So for me, highest priority, get ourselves off our dependence on foreign energy by developing all of our sources, including our renewable, solar, wind, nuclear, gas, clean coal. And by the way, we can't just say it's going to all be solar and wind. I love solar and wind, but they don't drive cars. And we're not going to all drive Chevy Volts. We're, we're, going to, we're going to have to get ourselves our domestic sources of carbon fuels as well that are less CO2 emitting, less polluting. That's going to get us energy independence and also reduce our, our emissions of greenhouse gases. And by the way, any policy that relates to something, we talk about cap and trade. I know that a lot of people talk about cap and trade. Look, we cannot, as America, enter into an agreement that causes our energy to become more expensive if we let the big emitters of the future, like China and Brazil, off the hook. We, we don't call it America warming. We call it global warming. And if it's going to have to be, if there's going to be an effort of this, it's got to be international in scope. Thank you. Good morning, Governor. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Good to sorry, see you. Sorry, I called the same lady here, but you're just fine. Oh, no, Loretta, no, no, you got the microphone, please. Just, she, was, she was wondering what was going on there. <laughs> okay. Good to see you in here again. Thank for you. For being here. Um, Governor, when you uh, get to Washington, how do you pro uh, plan to get this uh, spending in, in what the uh, spending that's going crazy? You got to Washington under control. Thank, Thank you. you. What do you do about the spending? How do you how do you deal with this? Right, right now, we got our colleagues in the in the House that are doing a, a heroic job. They're using every source of their their strength to fight the excessive spending of this administration, and I applaud them in that. Uh, they say they're not going to raise the the debt limit unless they see a, a commensurate reduction in in spending and plans to hold down our spending in the future. Congratulations to them for keeping that battle going going on. How would I deal with it? Well. There, there are really three parts of the budget. The first is what we'll call discretionary spending. That's about 20% of, of the budget. And that's got to come down a lot. We got a lot of programs in Washington we all like, but we don't have to have. When I came in as governor and had a $3 billion budget gap, there was not $3 billion all of just waste. There was some of that doing stuff we liked, but we simply couldn't afford. And at the federal level, we're now spending money on things we like, but we have to borrow money from the Chinese to pay for it. That doesn't make sense. And so I'll go to the budget and say, you know what, on some of these programs, I like them, but we've got to stop them. Because I'm not willing to pay for these by borrowing and putting this burden on my kids' future. So that's number one. That's a, that's a discretionary part. That's about, that's about 20% of federal spending. The next 20% of federal spending is military. There's a lot of waste in the military. But that waste I would like to eliminate and not use it to buy more programs or even fund programs I like, but instead to rebuild a strong and modern military. If we're going to send our men and women into harm's way, and we have them now in three places in harm's way at least, um, I want them to be well protected, well secured with the best armament in the world. Our, our, our Navy has been depleted and is on, is on a path to be even more depleted. It needs to be modernized. Our Air Force, likewise, needs to be modernized. I mean, I, I know that, that they're, they're uh, just putting in place a new series of, uh, of jets to do fueling for our fighter aircraft, in-air fueling. And I'm glad they're doing that. That's finally been made. But no, the, the fuelers that we have now, I believe, are 707s. I and mean, these were built in the 1960s. But we have a very and need to bring it up to date. And I'd have more boots on the ground with those military, I'd have more soldiers that are in our army, and finally I'd make sure we have enough funds to care for our veterans in the way that they deserve to care. So I've only gone to 40% of spending. 20% of discretionary, 20% in the military, then comes 60%, and 60% are the so-called mandatory programs, which are largely entitlements. Medicaid, which is the program for the poor, that I would send back to the states. Yeah. I would let the states care for their own poor and their own uninsured in the way the states feel best. That is the way to reduce cost, is the way to reduce fraud and abuse. Give those dollars back to the states, and that will help hold down the cost. <laughs> and Social Security
Security, the, the next two are Social Security and Medicare, programs for our seniors. No one in my party has proposed any change to those programs for anybody who's retired or near retirement. So anybody who's 60 or older don't even need to think about any changes. The question is, what are we going to promise people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s? And the answer is, let's tell them the truth. Let's not, let's not give them promises that we know can't possibly be met. And so I want to tell people the truth. I, I know that Representative Ryan has put a plan out. It's not the same as what I'll pull out, or I'll, I'll bring out. But, but it, uh, it takes a step forward to saying, how can we make sure that we, we spend only what we take in, how we make these programs sustainable. I want to keep Medicare and Social Security. I do not want them to be jeopardized. And so we want to make sure we put programs out that we can honor and that we can commit to the next generation we will be able to fund. So I'm going after those areas. We'll, entitlements will make sustainable, we'll send Medicaid back to the states, and we'll cut dramatically our discretionary budget. And by the way, I will, I will assure you that if I'm president of the United States, I will get America on track to have a balanced budget. It is immoral, in my view, for us as a nation to continue to spend. screen is education. This doesn't seem to be a topic in this campaign um, that I've heard even the press asking questions on this. So I'm going to ask a question about the national takeover in education right now by the Obama administration, which is similar to the national takeover in health care. And uh, I hope that this becomes a little bit more important in the campaign, especially when the candidate chosen runs against him. Um, as governor, you had some of the highest academic standards in the country. Number one. Yes. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, your students were scoring the highest in the country, proving that this should be a state and local control issue. But right now, we have Obama taking over education too, setting national standards. We're going to have a national assessment, which gives us a de facto national curriculum. And they can call it what they want, but we're going to end up with a national curriculum. Um, I guess my question to you is, would you uh, tell me your views on this, number one, and would you come out against this? Because I'm looking for a candidate right now who's going to be vocal and explain to everybody what is going on and then to let them know that we are going to fight against this. That no, this does not empower parents. How, what are we going to do when they set the standards? Where are these parents going to go who are in these schools with lousy curriculum, lousy education? Where do they go? Who, who, whose face is behind this? Because it's not on the state and local level. So I'd like your opinion on that. I'd like you to explain where you are on this. And I'm hoping that this is something that you can take to the campaign and um, maybe encourage the other candidates to, to be vocal on this. Because I think if all the candidates are probably the one who's best set to, to speak on this because you have experience with this. You've shown what can be done on the state level. Rick Perry's doing it right now in Texas. Um, and unfortunately, our governor here has just shifted it upwards. I mean, we've just lost, we've lost the power here because we've uh, adopted them. So if you can speak to you get some kids in school, by the way? Yes. How are they doing? They're doing okay. They're in Catholic school. They're in Catholic school. <laughs> We're, uh, you know, one of the reasons Massachusetts does so well with our students is we have such a strong Catholic school system. And, uh, and, and so, so many kids have choice. And the, and the Catholic school system has a very low tuition cost. So, so people of, of modest means or, or normal means are able to send their kids to Catholic schools. They have a very large uh, scholarship program. School choice is a huge source of, of the success in, in my state. I have to give credit to that. I, I agree with you, by the way. Um, it is, uh, it's amazing to me that there really are people who somehow don't think the Constitution was, was, was really that brilliant. Uh, that, uh, that they know better than the Constitution. I, I actually think that the decision by the founders to say, you know what, we are going to specifically limit the power of the federal government. We are going to give to the states 
the right and authority to deal with those things that's, that are actually closest to our citizens. So issues like caring for the poor, issues like education, these are going to be handled at the state and local level, closest to the people, where, by the way, the people can have their views more fully expressed, where if there's a problem, it can be changed more easily. It, it, in, in Massachusetts, we have a referendum program. If you don't like something in the state, you can put something on a ballot referendum, and we can change it, even if our elected representatives are not willing to do it. The, the states are the place for, for those issues that touch us most directly, and I can't think of many things that touch us as directly as the education of our children. Now we, I like what we have in my state. We have a, uh, we have a statewide series of, uh, as you mentioned, academic uh, criteria. We have a statewide curriculum. We, uh, we ask our kids to take a test every year to see how they're doing. You can't graduate from high school unless you pass the test. I mean this, and, and I think it's working pretty well. But I'll tell you one thing. If Barack Obama says, I'm going to take that and impose it on the nation, I will fight it to the nth degree. We, we do not have the federal government step in with their so-called experts taking over the rights of people, states, and local governments. It's against the Constitution, and it's wrong for America. So I'm here for that. And, and, and by the way, I just, you know what this is about. This is about millions and millions of dollars that go into the Obama campaign from the national teachers unions. And the bosses of those unions want to get their hands at education at the national level because they're losing it in a lot of, a lot of states. A lot of states are saying, no, we're holding it back. No, we, you can't do that. We want, per, we want to pay for performance. We want uh, uh, a, a process where, where those teachers that are failing are removed from the classroom. We, we want to have a more school choice. We want to have cyber learning. And, and, and so some of those unions are losing those battles and they want to take it over at the federal level. And I cannot imagine I can't imagine in America where you're going to have a White House, Republican or Democrat, or a Congress, Republican or Democrat, laying out what our kids have to be taught. That is unacceptable. I want to be able to go whichever state gives me my freedom. Thank you. Yes, sir. Go back to the days when you were running Bain. Someone came to you and said, we've got a couple of programs we're running. They stink. I'm going to cut them. And I think we need to put some people back to work. I'm going to do that. And we're spending too much money, so I'm going to cut costs. You would probably tell him, sir, come back to me with a detailed plan on all these issues, step one, step two, step three, step four. This is what I'm going to do. Now, you're a great manager. Why can't you treat us that same way? Give us a detailed program of what you're going to accomplish as president. I will. The best place to find that, by the way, in great detail, is my book, No Apology, where I lay out the challenges I think we face in our military globally. I lay out what I think is wrong with our economy. I lay out what I think is wrong with excessive federal spending, how I would change the entitlement programs. I lay it out in my book. And, and uh, it, it's hard to do in, in, uh, in, in a couple of minutes here, but take a look at the book. Take, it's, a, it's a good book. I'll give you a discount. Uh, it's a, <laughs> they're going for less money right now, I think. It's called No Apology, and so I'll do that in some detail. Yeah, I do it there in some detail. And I had about, I spent about almost nine months writing it. And by the way, I, you know, I hired a ghostwriter and, and sat down with the ghostwriter. Uh, he interviewed me and then came back with the first chapter, and I read it, and I said, this will never do. And, and so I sat down and, and uh, did the research and, and wrote it myself. And so you, you got me in there. So the English isn't that great, but, but the, hopefully the thoughts are okay. And, uh, and let, me, let me just tell you, for instance, on the economy, the things I do. Uh, because th that's the issue that I think most of us are, 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 are concerned about. Are we going to have an economy that's strong to care for us and to create jobs? And that's able to provide for our kids a prosperous future? And those of us who are retired, we want to make sure that we we give to our kids and our grandkids a nation that's strong and vibrant that can defend itself. And you can't defend yourself, by the way. You can't have a, 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 a first-tier military if you have a second-tier or third-tier economy. So, so what do you do to get the economy going? I've got, I've got seven things I'll mention. Uh, and I could go on to 14, but I'll start with seven. Number one, we've got to bring our corporate and employer taxes down to the levels that are competitive with others around the world. Number two... Number, number two, we have to change our regulatory and bureaucratic structure so that it's modern and up-to-date. We don't deregulate everything. We put in place modern dynamic regulations. 
Number, number three, we adjust our trade policies. We love trade with other nations, but we want those trade policies to be good for America, not just for the other guys. Number four, we put ourselves on a track to be energy independent of the cartels, as we were talking about early, earlier. Uh, am I at five? Number five, we abide by the rule of law. Every, every successful economy abides by the rule of the law, of law as opposed to by, by crony capitalism. And, and this, this president made an enormous error. When, when, when General Motors was finally taken bankrupt, bankrupt, which by the way, I proposed early on, it needs to go through bankruptcy so it can come out again and, and survive and create jobs once again. But when he finally took it bankrupt, he wiped out the interest of the senior lenders, just pushed aside the law, so he could give the company to the UAW. That, that sends shockwaves through a, a, a system that relies on the rule of law. We have to abide by the rule of law. And finally, we have to have great schools, the best in the world. I said finally, that was six, eight schools and seven. We have to have a government that doesn't spend more than it takes in. Because if you spend more year after year than you take in, people wonder whether the currency is going to be worth anything down the road. And if the currency is worthless, America can't have a future that creates jobs. Those are seven things I do to get the economy going. And uh, I see a thumbs up. That'll be enough. The next seven we'll get on another occasion. Thank you. that have to face uh, pre-existing conditions laws where they can't get insurance um, or it's hard to get through their employer. What are your thoughts and ideas on upholding this um, really amazing new chapter in the country? Yeah, my own view is that we need to to repeal Obamacare for, for a couple of reasons. One, one is, just, it, it's a it's a that it's a set, my, my bill of Massachusetts was 70 pages, and we dealt with the issue of pre-existing conditions, I think in a pretty effective way, 70 pages. His is 2,700 pages, and in those extra 2,600 and some odd pages, he does a lot more than just care for pre-existing conditions. He has the federal government take over and manage health care, just like they want to take over and manage education. And, and the American people are saying in every way they can, no way. Now, I've said if I'm president, I will repeal Obamacare. And by the way, on day one of my administration, I'll direct the Secretary of Health and Human Services to grant a waiver from Obamacare to all 50 states. So we'll take care of that. <laughs> that said, there's some things I want to make sure we do at the federal level. And one of them is relating to, to pre-existing conditions. And, and here's the issue. Let's say you're working at a company for 20 years and you happen to develop diabetes. And you know that now your health care is going to be real expensive. And that, and that employer you're working for goes out of business. Or you need to change jobs to move across the country to follow your family or whatever. And, and now you go to a new employer and they won't hire you because they can't get you insurance. Although they don't want to pay the cost of your, your care. Or the insurance company won't insure you because you've got a pre-existing condition. That doesn't make sense to me. So I would propose at the federal level we say that if individuals have been continuously covered for some period of time, that they can't be denied ongoing coverage because they've developed what's known as a pre-existing condition. That's something I'd say is just fair in dealing with, with insurance. There are other things I think we have to say about insurance. That is, we able, ought to be able to buy it across state lines and buy policies that make the most sense for us. And by the way, uh, employers and, and small groups ought to be able to combine together and, buy, and purchase in pools so we can get the discounts of groups. There are a number of things I'd like to do. And by the way, one more thing, let's get rid of them extraordinary cost of, of the malpractice system that we have. I, I, I agree with you that it's, uh, it's important for us to care for those that have pre-existing conditions, make sure that we can stay continuously insured. Yes, sir. Thank you for coming to Andrew. Thank you. Good to be back. Uh, this, my question, I think, goes back to one of the really important things that you're bringing up about uh, the role between the federal government and the states. Yeah. I, I know that you believe that we should repeal Roe versus Wade. And I was wondering if, if abortion becomes illegal in some states, uh, should there be criminal sanctions against uh, doctors who still perform abortions or for women who, who, who get abortions? I don't think anyone's proposed that, has it? Uh, I mean, uh, there are, you know, I mean, some of this, you know, the I don't, I don't, I don't think any, I don't think any political person has talked about criminal sanctions. Uh, I think the right thing uh, for, uh, for
for matters related to uh, to abortion uh, it is very similar to what I described in other measures, which is to return this to the states. Let the states make their own choice. I'm pro-life, um, and, and I think this is a decision best handled, like many other things, at the state level. Thank you. <laughs> I want to say thank you for being here this morning. You're uh, you, 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 okay. Yes. Hi. Hi. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Uh, I just have a question about this whole debt ceiling yeah. thing that's going on. Yeah. Um, if they raise the debt ceiling, they're just going to spend more money. I mean, that's just a welcome mat to spend more money. I mean, it's the false premise that the uh, faith and whatever of paying our bills, blah, blah, blah. I know that <laughs> in my paycheck every week, they're yeah. still taking out money. Yeah. So I know money is still coming into the government. And all they have to do is pay our bills with that money and stop spending it on shrimp running on treadmills. And you know, all those other programs are absolutely ridiculous. I am tired of the government raising the debt ceiling on my back. Well, that is a, that, that's a powerful point. The, um, the spending that's gone on in this nation that hasn't been financed by ourselves just makes no sense at all. How do you, you know, I ask myself, we do wonderful things in the world. We, we, uh, we have great humanitarian efforts that we carry out throughout the world. I love those things. They're wonderful. But you know, we're borrowing money from the Chinese. We're borrowing money from them to go help other people. Uh, it's like, wait a second, why aren't the Chinese helping other people? Why, why can't we, why can't we say that? There, there, there are great needs in the world, and we're going to help you. We've got all these these organizations from the Red Cross and others that, that can help do that. But why don't you help funding fund those things, as opposed to every year take uh, take you know loan more and more money to us so we can keep on getting ourselves deeper and deeper in debt? It puts us in jeopardy. It puts our families in jeopardy. Uh, I, I saw an article in USA Today. I think it said that that the that the average American household has with you take the national debt and the unfunded liabilities, almost a half a million dollars of national debt and obligations. It, it's, it's unthinkable. And we, and we have to say stop. And, and I, uh, I can tell you this, I'm pretty confident that we're going to have a Republican House, Republican Senate, and Republican White House. Because this president's failed. He has, look, he's a nice guy. He's well-spoken. He could talk a dog off a meat wagon. Uh, and uh, and yet he hasn't delivered. And, and we've, we've had three years now. See, at the beginning, it was all George Bush. We're not hearing a lot about George Bush now, by the way, as, as we're seeing unemployment at 9% plus. It went up again today. We're not hearing a lot about George Bush because, you know what? He can't keep blaming George Bush. This is now his economy. And what he has done has failed the American people. And the borrowing and the spending and the $1.6 trillion deficit, the, these numbers are his. They're on his back. And it's why he's going to lose. We're going to have a Republican House, Republican Senate, and Republican President. And it's not that Republicans have all the answers, but one answer we have is stop spending more than you take in. And I think the whole time. so that we don't just keep on adding on debt, more and more debt to the backs of our kids. You guys, I, I want to, I wanna, oh, gentlemen, yes, sir. I want to hear all this mic for you. You don't need to get up if you don't want it. I'm just a handicapped old citizen. <laughs> I wanted to say to you, I'm an ordinary American. I have been self-employed all my life, and I really appreciate what the Medicare has done for me. But at the same time, you're pointing out, and I know, Medicare is being very wasteful and it's filled with fraud. I believe a simple idea you might carry to Washington is that no longer will the government pay bills to doctors and hospitals without having received the written approval of the patients. I can point out to you this. In one cancer treatment that I've had, and I'm thankful for that, $120,000 per treatment. In one hospital, five thousand dollars in another, because I moved to Florida. Something is wrong with the overseeing of the Medicare system, and with that movement, we do need the care. We wear the other. We pay the taxes. We should have it, but we can't have it in the manner that it's being given. Oh, that's a great point. Yes, I'm doing 
doing fine now. It's <laughs> great to hear you. That's what you're doing fine now. I won't tell, ask you the name of the hospital in Florida, but they got some good ones there. Um, you're absolutely right. The, the waste in our healthcare system is absolutely amazing. And one of the challenges is this. Whenever you say, I mean, think about this. 300 million people is, is a hard number to get your mind around. The, the population of America. Think of the differences between New Hampshire and the Montana, or, or Mississippi and, uh, uh, and Michigan, or, or California and Rhode Island. Think of the differences, the, the differences in population, health care system, needs of the people, incomes, enormous differences. Then they put in place a single program, Medicare, all run by one government, trying to oversee the whole program, trying to get rid of fraud and abuse. The fraud and abuse is extraordinary. The paperwork is massive, and so the waste is just overwhelming. And so I would like to see more choice brought into Medicare. I'd like to have patients have the ability to choose the current Medicare plan or, or a plan that's provided by a private provider. And let competition, competition works. I like the free market. Let competition work and let, let the seniors decide which plans they like. Now, I'm not, again, I'm not talking about changing anything for somebody who's currently retired or near retirement. But for people in their 20s and 30s and 40s, I'd like more choice. And, and I like Medicare Advantage. You, you don't, are you a Medicare Advantage? You think so? All right. Well, you're an advantaged person anyway. So, there, there, we have more choice now that's offered in Medicare. That's a good thing. This, this is a, this is a program we have to protect. As you say, Medicare has to be protected. Social Security has to be protected. No one wants to cut those programs away. We want to keep them in place. But one thing we've got to do is, is bring to those programs, or bring at least to Medicare, where you're dealing with health care, the kind of dynamism and competition and, and choice that has allowed the rest of our economy to be so vibrant. And I, uh, I congratulate, uh, congratulate you on being wise enough to see the, the difference between a hospital that charges $100,000 and one that charges $5,000, and saying, I'm going to go to the one that charges $5,000. If that happened more, we'd save a lot of money in this country. And, and I'd like to see that happen by the choices that we provide to Medicare. I'll give you another one, and that's in regards to higher rates and social security. We should have regulation that permits me as an employee to, to deposit my monies in the bank of my choice and to withdraw it under the plans of the federal government's plan. But there's so much going on wrong with what's being handled in the social security account. It's unbelievable that that we can have a social security system that's going to bank. This can't be told. It wouldn't if it was individual accounts like I raised could be right. Well, I, I have an idea in that regard. And, and see what you think about this. I know that we have these special deals, IRAs. If you want to save your money to reti for retirement, you can put it in a special account. And if you need it for certain purposes, you're allowed to take it out. If you need it for other purposes, you get taxed when you take it out. My own view is this. If you make $250,000 a year or less, and that's almost all Americans. You ought to be able to save your money any way you want to, for any way, anything you'd like to, without paying taxes on interest, dividends, or capital gains. But you will save your money. Every time. I know I'm taking you a little longer than I'm supposed to, so I'm going to stop here. But I want to tell you, I'm I'm confident in our future. There's a uh, there's a rising current in this country saying, you know what, we're taking back America, we're going to restore the principles that made America great in the first place. We're all part of that. New Hampshire has a loud voice. The fact that you're here this morning speaks volumes about the interest of the people of New Hampshire in choosing a leader who will get America right again. I hope you'll help me in that effort. I've got a lot of time. And